Hey guys, welcome back to Maker's Corner. In today's video, I'm going to show you guys how I made my very own little mesh-tastic node. Now, before you click off this video thinking, oh, there's already plenty of them out there, hang on a second. There is one feature that I couldn't find on any of them, and that is this nice little flip-up antenna, which I know seems like a very simple thing, but as someone who likes to travel with their mesh-tastic node, having something that folds up nicely like this, I can just shove in my bag and go, is a really nice quality of life thing to have. So, if you're ready to find out how I turned this idea into reality, well, let's get started. So, after spending a bit more time than I care to admit to in Fusion 360 designing all these parts, I finally ended up with something that I was quite happy with and started 3D printing everything out. Now, of course, just like every project I do, there will be links down in the description for where you can get all these files, and as always, I do include my step files as well, so if you guys want to make any changes, you are more than welcome to do so, and those step files will really make it much, much easier for you to do so. And I'll also have some affiliate links down in the description to where you can buy some of the things that I used in this project. Alright, with the 3D printing out of the way, we can move on to assembly, and for this, we're going to start off by installing our GPS module. This simply snaps into place and then is secured with one of the included screws. Once that's done, we can flip the board over and we'll take a look at some of these pads. Now, we're going to be using the headers that came with the OLED display, and we need headers for AN1 and ground. We're also going to need headers for SDA, SCL, ground, and voltage in. Now, while we could simply just solder directly to these pads, having pin headers means that we'll be able to easily connect and disconnect things if we needed to later on for troubleshooting or for any other potential reason you might want to take everything apart. And thanks to the magic of video editing, I'm going to save you guys from watching this absolute butcher job that I'm about to do soldering these uh, headers on here. I don't know what it is about me not being able to solder when a camera's rolling, but... Hopefully I'll get over that eventually. But regardless, with this soldering travesty out of the way, we can now move on to the next step, which is preparing some of our DuPont wires. So I grabbed four wires, and I just snipped the ends off of one side, and then proceeded to strip some of the insulation back so we can pre-tin our wires and get them ready for soldering up to our OLED display. I started off by feeding just one of the wires through and soldering that in place just to kind of anchor everything in place, and then I went back and fed each of the other three wires through their respective holes, folded the wire over a little bit to anchor everything in place, and then got to work soldering up our last three connections. And hey, what do you know, these last few solder joints actually came out looking not completely awful. Maybe my streak of not being able to solder on camera is coming to an end. But anyways, with the last three connections to our OLED display soldered up, we can bend the excess wire up, and with some flush cutters, we can snip it away so that everything's nice and clean, and there's less chance of them getting in the way or potentially shorting out on something later. Now I'm going to pause the video here for just a quick second so I can show you guys the connections we just made. It is VCC ground. SCL and SDA, and these correspond to the headers that we installed on the main board just a few moments ago. Now we can move on to getting our wires for our user slash power button ready. Just like the first set of wires earlier, I cut one end off of some of our DuPont connectors, stripped the wires back, and then pre-tinned the ends in preparation for soldering them to our switch. I also slid some heat shrink tube over the wires so that we can protect our connections once they're made. I fed the wire into the little hole on the end of our limit switch and just soldered our wires up to it, and then finished it off by sliding our heat shrink tube over our connections and using a little bit of heat to close them down and protect our connections for good. With most of the wiring for this project complete, we can move on to everyone's favorite part, installing heat set inserts. We're using M3 by 4 heat set inserts for everything, with the exception of the mounting plate for the Rack 4631, in which we'll be using M2.5 heat set inserts. 
And as always, make sure to take your time when installing heat set inserts, especially on this project. Some of them are pretty close to the edges, so you want to make sure you go nice and slow to make sure you're not blowing anything out. Here's the Rack 4631 mounting board that we use the M2.5 heat set inserts on. And again, make sure to go slow and take your time and make sure everything goes down nice and flush. We can now get to work on installing the screen into its mount. The side where the heat set inserts are closest to the edge of the bracket is for the top of the board. Now to secure it in place, we're just going to use the included screws and screw it directly into the plastic. Just be careful not to over tighten them because you can and will strip out the holes if you do so. I then put a very thin bead of hot glue over the wires just to protect them from shorting out on anything, but this step is 100% optional. Now even though this board does come pre-flashed with Meshtastic on it, I decided to flash it with the latest version just to make sure we were fully up to date. Now the first step in this process is to first connect all of the antennas. You never ever 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 want to power one of these things up without the antennas connected because you can and will burn out the radios really, really fast. So using the USB port on the main board for the Rack 4631 unit we're using here, I connected it to my laptop and went to the meshtastic.org website, which I'll have linked down below, and I simply followed the on-screen instructions for how to flash the latest version of Meshtastic to my device. Now since these instructions can change over time, instead of showing you guys exactly what I did, I do encourage you to just go to the website and follow whatever the most recent instructions are, so that way you have the best chance of getting a successful flash. Now before going any further, I would like to take a quick moment to thank the sponsor of today's project, PCBWay. At PCBWay, prototyping is super super simple and very affordable. If you have a 3D printing need, simply go to their website, upload your model, select how many parts you need, the material, and what color or infill you need, and get an instant quote in seconds. It really is that simple. And of course, PCBWay offers more than just 3D printing. They also offer high-precision CNC machining, laser cutting, sheet metal fabrication, including powder coating, anodizing, bead blasting, and all sorts of other finishing processes. Now, of course, we can't talk about PCBWay without talking about their high-quality PCBs. With a turnaround time as fast as 24 hours, they are a no-brainer for your PCB needs. They offer fast worldwide shipping, and if you use my link down below, you can get a nice little discount on your first order. So thanks again PCBWay for sponsoring the channel and this project, now let's get back to it. With the latest firmware now flashed, we can actually start assembly. I'm going to first install the GPS antenna, and there's a little channel here for the wire to route down. I accidentally put it on the wrong side, don't worry, in your version it will be fixed. I then took our Rack 4631 mount and slid it over top and use some M3 bolts to secure it in place. And this also secures our GPS antenna in its counterboard slot. Once that was complete, I moved on to our lower antenna amount and we secured this in place with four M3 screws. And then we also installed our Bluetooth antenna and secured that in place with its bracket and two more M3 screws. Now, the final thing to add before we can really get around to starting to assemble the body of this is the IPEX2 SMA adapter. For this, I took the nut and I just dropped it down to the hole and I started shaking things around a bit. I actually got lucky when I was testing this whole thing out and got it to just fall right in. Uh, but this time I needed to use the antenna to kind of convince it to fall into its slot. And then using the back of the antenna to hold it in place, I first got everything finger tight and then I forgot to record this part, but I did actually use a pair of pliers to really tighten things down extra tight. And we can now finally move on to actually starting to assemble this thing. I mixed up some two-part epoxy, you really don't need a whole lot, and I just spread a little bit along the inside wall here. Again, you don't need to go crazy, just a few little thin coats and a few spots is going to be more than enough to secure this thing in place permanently. I grabbed the top section that we just installed most of our hardware into, and with the large hole facing towards the screen cutout, I carefully positioned it and placed it into its slot, and then flipped everything over, placed a heavy object on top, and gave it some time to cure. Now, even though I used 5-minute epoxy, I did give it a few hours to set properly before installing our Rack 4631 mainboard into here. 
And I just used the included M2.5 screws for this. Once the rack mainboard was secured in place, I grabbed the IPEX connectors for our LoRa antenna, our GPS antenna, and our Bluetooth antenna, and I got them connected at this point. It was now time to install our OLED screen, and for this I just slid it into place and then very loosely installed four M3 screws, and then I kind of got the screen aligned and then tightened everything down. Now for the second to last piece of hardware, our user slash power button, I simply slid the wires down through this hole and being sure to keep the connection parallel to the body of the enclosure, I secured it in place with a big old glob of hot glue. This way it can be removed later if need be. Now as far as the wiring goes, it's really not going to be easy for me to show you where everything plugs into, so I decided to make this little diagram to show you guys where everything plugs in. You do need to make sure that the VCC pin from the screen goes to VCC, ground goes to ground, SCL goes to SCL, and SDA to SDA, and then as far as the user slash power button, uh, either one of those two wires can go to either ground and A in one, it doesn't matter which way they go, as you do not need to worry about polarity. And now the final step before we can close everything up and call this project complete is to modify the battery slightly. These leads are a little too short, so I cut the connectors off and then stripped the wires back a little bit so that we could solder in some extensions, and of course we'll be using some heat shrink too to protect the connections so nothing shorts out. There's nothing fancy going on here, I just grabbed some scrap wires I had lying around that were of similar gauge and simply soldered them to the wires coming off of the battery. I slid some heat shrink over those two fresh connections to protect them and then I added two more pieces because next we're going to solder our battery connector back on so that we have a way to connect the battery up to our REC 4631 mainboard. With the heat shrink slid into place protecting our final two connections, we can now take our battery and put it into the battery cover with the wire coming out the little slot in the side, and then we can secure it in place with some more M3 screws. And remember from earlier when I said you should never power one of these things up without the antennas attached? Well, that's what I'm going to do right now. I'll go ahead and screw our antenna on, and then we'll be perfectly safe to connect our battery and screw our lid on. But wait, there's one very, very important thing we need to check before doing so. Go ahead and take a close look at your battery connector. Make sure that the polarity matches what the board is expecting. If it's backward, which was the case with the battery I'm using, you'll need to de-pin that connector and re-pin it in the correct orientation, and I'll be adding a link down in the description to a great video to show you how to do that. With our battery polarity issue corrected, we can now plug it in, and we can then attach our bottom lid using some more M3 screws. Now the moment you plug in the battery, everything should fire up for the first time, which means we can get started on configuring our Mesh-tastic node and start testing. And fortunately for me, I have just the person to help me do so. Now thankfully I have a mom with absolutely zero social life, which means she's the perfect candidate to help me test this out. Ow. Um, so I'm going to give her one of my older nodes that I don't use anymore. There you go. Thanks. And uh, we're going to go take a quick little drive and make sure everything works. Alright, so we've gone a few miles away and I've got my Mesh-tastic node here with me. It's, of course, Florida, so it's starting to rain, so we're going to make this quick. I'm going to try and send my mom a message. Hello. How are you? And hopefully, in just a few seconds here, yep, got the received on my end. So we'll see if she can respond. And hopefully she does so quickly because I really don't want to get rained on out here. <sighs> I hate Florida summer. It's awful. And there she goes. I am well. How are you? Great. But it's starting to rain. Starting to rain. Talk to you later. And got the little cloud icon. So one downside to Mesh-tastic is it doesn't do very well when the weather is not so great and, well, it's starting to rain, which definitely screws with the signal a bit. So uh, hopefully that'll go through. Yep, it finally went through. And I'm gonna let her respond one more time and then we're gonna get the hell out of here because, uh, well, I already took a shower. I'm not trying to take a second one. 
Okay, so quick spoiler alert. I did not give her a chance to respond because the rain started coming down a bit harder and it was all I could do to pack up my equipment, toss in the car, and get out of there before we got soaked. Uh, what I can tell you, however, is from the testing that we've done so far, I've managed to get some pretty great uh, range out of this device. Using this Mesh-tastic node, I was able to communicate with devices that were 10 kilometers, or roughly 6 miles, away from me. Which, for a Mesh-tastic node, especially a small portable one like this, is pretty darn good. Unfortunately, when I was doing those tests, I wasn't recording, and due to time constraints, I don't have time to wait to re-record that again. So, unfortunately, this is the only test that I was able to do on camera, but if you are interested in making one of these, all the links for everything will be down below. And if you enjoyed this video, I really hope that you'll consider liking and subscribing. It really does help out small creators like myself. As always, I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time.